Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Patty Prelock, Interim President for the University of Vermont, and I want to welcome you to this year's Aiken Lake Lecture, one of four lectures that the University of Vermont does as part of our annual presidential lecture series. And this year's lectures have focused on the question of free speech. The Aiken Lecture was actually established in 2018 to honor Vermont Senator George Aiken. Senator Aiken's family insisted that the Aiken Lectures be of the highest caliber and possess national or international stature. We've certainly fulfilled that requirement in bringing Nadine Strassen here with us today. Nadine served as the president of the American Civil Liberties Union for nearly two decades in the 1990s and in the 2000s, a tenure marked by her and the ACLU's passionate commitment to free speech. She taught for 31 years at New York Law School, where she is now the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law Emerita. She's also a senior fellow at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, arguably the most prominent free speech advocacy group in the US today. She has served on too many boards to count, a few of which include the Electronic Privacy Information Center, Feminists for Free Expression, Human Rights Watch, and the National Coalition Against Censorship. Nadine has written and spoken widely about the harms of hate speech and the necessity of rigorously defending free speech both because of and in spite of those harms. Her philosophy perhaps is best articulated by the title of her 2018 book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship. Other books include Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know, and speaking of race, speaking of sex, hate speech, civil rights, and civil liberties. When Nadine agreed to join us today, she suggested that we structure her time with us a little differently than we typically do with our lectures, and instead wanted to have an interview. We are so fortunate that our own E. Thomas Sullivan, um, professor of political science and um, President Emeritus, a free speech and constitutional law scholar, has graciously agreed to start off the conversation with Nadine, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So Nadine, we are so grateful for you to be here today. We look forward to your thoughts and on some of the most difficult questions today. And Tom, thank you so much for agreeing to interview Nadine. Welcome. <laughs> In 1964, Mario Savio, a young college student from Queens, New York, volunteered for the Mississippi Freedom Summer, going door to door to register black voters. Savio suffered a beating by the white knights of the Ku Klux Klan, but he was the lucky one. Three of his fellow volunteers were murdered. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. That fall, Mario returned to school at the University of California, Berkeley, joining many other students inspired by the moral clarity of the civil rights movement. But when they began to participate in civil rights demonstrations around San Francisco, the university cracked down and banned all political activity on campus. October 1st, a group of defiant students set up tables on a campus plaza to raise funds and recruit volunteers for the civil rights movement. One of them, Jack Weinberg, is arrested by the campus cops and thrown into a police car. And the students have what they want, a confrontation with the administration over the new rule forbidding political activity on campus. A large crowd gathers, and someone yells, sit down. Suddenly, hundreds of students are blocking the car. 
One of them approaches the police to ask if he can stand on the car and address the crowd. The cop says it's okay if he takes off his shoes. Mario Savio climbs atop the car in his socks and rallies the crowd to a compelling cause. College students are American citizens with the absolute right to speak freely under the First Amendment of the Constitution. I'm not here to destroy something. We're all here to try to build something. Why don't you help us? Overnight, for 32 hours into the next day, the students block the car and make speeches. Jack Weinberg, still stuck in the back seat, has to pee in a bottle. Beyond the plaza, hundreds of policemen prepare tear gas and clubs. But the next day is Parents' Day, with visitors expected on campus. So the administration agrees to negotiate. The students release the police car, and a new student group called FSM, the Free Speech Movement, is born. Tables have been permitted out in front of Bancroft and Telegraph to distribute literature. The effect of cutting this off is to stop political activity on this campus. The remarkable thing about this entire situation, there's been a coalition from Youth for Goldwater all the way over from the Young Socialist Alliance. And I'm proud to say that American students are united on one issue, and that's the First Amendment privileges of freedom of speech, the right to advocate and discuss at any time, at any place. And they took the position that we want to undertake these activities on campus property itself, and we said this is not possible. The president of the University of California was Clark Kerr. Kerr thought of the university as a knowledge factory for the mass production of students. If this is a firm, and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager, and I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees, and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product for human beings. December 2nd. Mario Savio speaks on the plaza in front of Sproul Hall, the Berkeley Administration Building. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Inspired by Savio's speech, over a 1,000 students now enter and occupy Sproul Hall in an act of mass civil disobedience. They remain overnight, sharing a meal, talking politics, and watching Charlie Chaplin movies. The next day, the police enter and arrest 700 of them. The students go limp and peacefully accept their arrest, adopting the nonviolent tactics of the civil rights movement. Four days later, 16,000 people gather on campus at the Greek theater. President Kerr endorses a statement from the chairman of all the academic departments restricting the free speech of students. Mario Savio rises to speak in opposition, but suddenly he is seized by the police. The brutal tactics shock many people in the crowd, including many members of the faculty. The next day, the faculty meets to consider the adoption of a new free speech resolution. Thousands of students listen to the debate. Moves the following propositions. One, that the time, place, and manner of conducting political activity on the campus shall be subject to reasonable regulation to prevent interference with the normal functions of the university. Two, that the content of speech or advocacy should not be restricted by the university. All in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The motion is carried. The victory of the free speech movement comes on December 8th, Mario Savio's birthday. No, no restrictions on the content of speech save those provided by the courts. And that's an enormous amount of freedom. And I'd like to say, at this time, I'm confident, I'm confident that the students, the faculty, the University of California will exercise their freedom 
with the same responsibility they've shown in winning their freedom. Perhaps the FSM was so successful because the principles of the free speech movement were truly American principles and on the leading edge of a massive political wave. Within a year, students were demonstrating against the war in Vietnam and fighting for the rights of American women. Free speech would prove to be the key that unlocked a revolution in American politics. Patty, for your gracious introductions for both of us. And we welcome all of you to this distinguished Aiken Lecture, a great tradition here at the university, as our president mentioned. Um, and um, as we pick up here in this last comment about the Vietnam War, it's quite fitting, I think, here in Vermont, in the University of Vermont, that we recognize that it was our senior United States Senator, George Aiken, who helped bring that war to an end when he made the quite famous statement today, um, just declare we won and bring them home. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, a few years after, mm -hmm. <laughs> changing presidents, uh, that actually happened. So we're very proud, Nadine, that you're here at the University of Vermont I'm, in I'm, a very distinguished Aiken lecture. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, it's such an honor to be here, Tom. And Thanks to Patty and to you and to the audience for the warm welcome. I, I want to tell you that I, I didn't want to travel <coughs> with my precious certificate of my honorary degree from the University of Vermont. I didn't want to take the risk of losing it, but I made a Xerox <laughs> copy of it. And I am so proud that I have been admitted to the degree of Doctor of Laws with all of the honors, rights, and privileges. Um, and it's really such a treasured honorary degree that I got from this university in 1992. Um, in your honor, I'm wearing your beautiful color of green and gold. Thank you for having pretty colors. And you saw I wore it in the, in the publicity <coughs> photo, uh, photo as well. <laughs> Welcome again. We're delighted that you joined a very distinguished group of lecturers that preceded you. So we have an opportunity at this point to um, have some back and forth exchange between the two of us, uh, shared by all of you, I hope. And uh, we're going to set aside an appropriate time uh, to have your questions and answers at the end. And I think we're due to perhaps conclude by about a quarter to six, so about an hour and 15 minutes. So we'll, I'll, I'll try to manage it so we have plenty of time for all of you to think about, hopefully be uh, provocative. Mm -hmm. uh, pro by, uh, by your comments. Well, we just saw a wonderful, for those of us who were actually around during the Vietnam War, uh, a wonderful video from the uh, 1950s and 60s civil rights marches in the South through an, in the start of the uh, free speech movement at Berkeley. Uh, so why don't we start, Nadine, our questions right there, mm -hmm. the arc of history. Mm -hmm. And um, we are all reflecting and thinking as we see that movie, mm -hmm. um, about last spring on our college campuses. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that arc almost full circle, uh, I'd ask you to share some of your thoughts about how that freedom won mm -hmm. and, and your passion for the First Amendment and your spectacular scholarship on the subject, how we came out in the spring relative to the importance of free speech or did we cross the line? And I really admire your scholarship on the First Amendment. And I, I mean it. I, well, I had the honor of blurbing Tom's book, uh, most recent book on point. You know, every time I watch that film, I am so struck by something that I think today's students <laughs> largely are ignorant of, and that is the essential 
interconnection between the civil rights movement and the free speech movement. And I also th am struck by how many students today take for granted this right that was completely denied. I know it seems like ancient history to young students, but in our lifetimes, right. uh, when we were in their place, <clears throat> that the particular expression that students were being denied the right to engage in was pro-civil rights advocacy, trying to recruit other students to join them in going to Mississippi and other places in the South uh, to help people exercise their right to vote. Here, as we're in an election season, it's hard to think of any speech that's more important in a democracy. Um, and another striking aspect of the film is when they quote <clears throat> one of the students saying, you know, all students, regardless of their political differences, are united on the importance of free speech. And he mentions students for Goldwater, which today's students might not realize Goldwater was the counterpart of Donald Trump, I guess, insofar as he was the Republican candidate for president, uh, all the way over to the Young Students Alliance. And I thought it was also striking to hear Martin Luther King say, the greatness of <coughs> America is the right to protest for rights. And he also illustrates how we should not take that precious right for granted. Most people know that Martin Luther King wrote a famous letter from a Birmingham jail, but I think most people don't know what he was in jail for. I'm not gonna ask you to show, raise your hands, but don't be embarrassed if you don't know. Most people are shocked to learn that his crime was exercising what we now consider to be the most important manifestation mm -hmm. of free speech, and that is the right to peacefully protest government policies, and in particular, government policies that were unconstitutional and violating basic human rights. Um, and I have found, part of the reason I love this film is I have found that a little bit of history goes a long way. Students who tend to be contemptuous of free speech at worst or indifferent at best are very surprised to learn that it has promoted values that wonderfully they are crusading for racial justice and social progress and voting rights and uh, equality. So um, we've come full circle in the sense that freedom of speech is still embattled, uh, but it is very much embattled from many students themselves <clears throat> rather than from the administration. Uh, starting a few years ago, my colleagues at FIRE and I started to notice a complete reversal. In the past, it was the administration that was restricting free speech and students protesting against the restrictions as we saw in this film. Uh, and then things shifted and we had more and more students on more and more campuses going to the administration saying, please protect us <coughs> against speech that we consider controversial or dangerous or harmful. I appreciate your comment about um, civil disobedience. Uh, could you define for us and share your experience the difference between protected speech, civil disobedience, and unprotected speech, as we may have uh, seen uh, on the last spring at the protests on campus, those, those differentiations and where the lines are drawn. Okay, so let me start first with the distinction between protected and unprotected speech, because civil <coughs> disobedience means the uh, willing Act engagement in expressive conduct that you know is unprotected, that is uh, prohibited, and being willing to uh, endure whatever the discipline or punishment is for it. So I have to smile because here we are to First Amendment 
uh, professors who will spend an entire semester uh, teaching our students the distinction between protected and unprotected speech, but I'll try to do it in a paragraph, <laughs> and you'll forgive me for uh, a bit oversimplifying. <laughs> but you know, the more I have studied free speech law for all of its complexity, the more I have come to admire its enormous common sense and fairness. Uh, it really comes down to two fundamental principles, one of which defines the protected speech that is never a justification for government to censor, and <laughs> the other is the complementary principle that says when government may restrict the speech. So let's start with the protection principle. It's often referred to, well, first of all, the Supreme Court has called this the bedrock principle of our whole free speech jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. So a good place to start. Uh, and it's often called the viewpoint neutrality or content neutrality principle. You heard the characters in the film, Mario Savio and others, talking about this, that government and universities may never restrict or punish speech solely because of disapproval, disagreement, even <clears throat> revulsion toward the viewpoint, the message, the content of the speech. If we hate the speech, if we think it's conveying a hateful or evil or dangerous message, it's not for the government to take away from us the decision whether to listen to it or not. That is for us as individuals to raise our own voices or engage in some other response, which could include ignoring the speech. Um, however, when you get beyond the content of the speech, and here's where the complementary principle comes in, and you look at it in its overall context, when in all the facts and circumstances, the speech either directly causes or imminently threatens certain specific, serious, demonstrable harm. There's a tight and direct connection between the speech and the harm. And the harm is not solely disagreement <clears throat> with the idea, right? Then government or universities may and should punish the speech. So let me give you, if I may, Please. an example. Uh, this one, well, I'll give an example from, from campus. Um, if you have uh, students who are engaged in a demonstration uh, voicing slogans that other students and faculty members and members of the campus community consider to be hateful or consider to be advocating violence, that <coughs> is not a justification for suppressing that speech. The fact that you disagree with it, the fact that you think it's even evil, or that it might ultimately potentially lead to harm, does not justify suppression. If, however, uh, particular <coughs> students target these uh, insulting, inflammatory messages at an individual student or a small group of students and you know, repeat the statement and stalk the student around the campus repeating those statements, that can well constitute uh, targeted harassment, targeted bullying, even a threat, all of which have been deemed to satisfy the emergency principle. So, you know, we've all heard that the devil is in the details or context, it depends on the context. Although that statement was mocked when it was made by university presidents, as we all know, that is a correct statement of law. You, you connected several dots there that I want to underscore. Um, the definition of hate speech, where the line is between protected speech and hate speech. Hate speech, uh, whether we like it or not, as Nadine just said, is protected speech, First Amendment rights under the present Supreme Court interpretation. This is where some of the real debate, the, the rub is, between vile, terrible, offensive speech that is protected, according to our Supreme Court, and where the line is, and you described, uh, I think, very uh, accurately the the uh, true threat test. Mm, yeah. so, so for you historians out in the crowd, 
um, at least I think it got morphed in this way. A very famous uh, Supreme Court terms of clear and present danger. Mm -hmm. You remember that, and we kind of think we know what clear and present danger is. Nadine just described a direct a threat, a harassment, an attack, a potentially violent attack on someone. Uh, or fighting words doctrine mm -hmm. kind of morphed into that. And now the test that she's just described for us is the so-called true threat test. Mm -hmm. So hate speech is protected. We might argue about that. A, a wonderful passionate defender of this concept because of its importance in the First Amendment speech. But, but if you cross the line into clear and present danger, fighting words that now become a true threat, I'm coming to get you identified a person or a specific group of people that has the imminent uh, right now potential threat of violence, that crosses the line. And, and, that, and may, <clears throat> I, you know, in my experience, Tom, when people give me examples of hateful mm. speech that they think should be punished, uh, in a, a vast majority of the instances, it is already subject to punishment. I think the um, paradigmatic <coughs> example that most people have in their mind is uh, you know, one person or a small group of people uh, uttering targeted racist or other discriminatory epithets toward another group of people. Uh, that likely is punishable as fighting words, as a true threat, even intentional incitement of imminent violence. And let me give you um, an account, you know, complementary examples where the hateful message could not have been punished just because of its hateful content, but in a particular context, it could have been punished. And that comes from Charlottesville, Virginia right. in 2017. Uh, when the Unite the Right demonstrators were marching and chanting, you will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. I, I literally get chills every time I say that, uh, especially as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, but as a lifelong crusader for human rights. I, I cannot consider a message more loathsome, and yet I do, I shouldn't say and yet, and therefore I strongly oppose government's power to suppress it solely because it is considered an a hateful message in that time and place because Martin Luther King's expression, and by the way, today Black Lives Matter and other expression that some of us may consider the opposite of hate speech is denounced as hate speech by various you know, powerful public officials. So, but when you get beyond the content of that message, and they did in Charlottesville, the night before the planned demonstration, the Unite the Right demonstrators marched en masse toward a group of counter demonstrators who were opposing the white supremacists who were ringed around the statue of Thomas Jefferson in the middle of the University of Virginia campus. And they were brandishing lighted tiki torches at menacingly close distance to the counter demonstrators. That is a punishable true threat. And in all of the studies that have been done, including a nonpartisan study that was commissioned by the city council, uh, there has been criticism of law enforcement for not having arrested the demonstrators at that yes. point. And I say this with the greatest respect uh, for <laughs> law enforcement because how delicate a judgment they have to make. How often they get criticized for doing too much, you know, for too quickly uh, punishing, restricting expression and arresting protesters. But here's a situation where they're criticized for exactly the opposite. And I think we have to be uh, very sensitive to that difficulty. But also it is the responsibility of the elected officials and the uh, law enforcement officials to plan in advance to be very aware of when that line is crossed and to take effective action against um, speech that is not only unprotected, but is interfering with the free speech of other people, right? The counter demonstrators are gonna be deterred from exercising their free speech rights when they reasonably fear that they're gonna be subject to attack. Well, you underscore uh, the, the really important point here about 
the, the so-called exception that the Supreme Court has made. While we have a very almost absolutist First Amendment speech rights with four specific exceptions we maybe don't have to go into other than true, true threat. One other I want to talk about later. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that the public institution, the government or public university, has the right to engage in reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. That's exactly what Nadine was just showing you where the line, line is there. Uh, and the other point that I think you've just made that we need to underscore is reasonableness. How do you define that subjective term reasonableness? Well, as she said a moment ago, context, situationalness, all of that matters. So Charlottesville, Ku Klux Klan, dark, white garb and, and their flames going, uh, context, how much of a threat was that? Mm -hmm. And then you can invoke time, place, manner, reasonableness mm -hmm. restrictions going back to the true threat test or the clear and present danger test where that line then is clearly crossed. Yeah. And you know, I have great sympathy for university officials as well. As I was commiserating with Patty, uh, there was an article because they are also um, having to toe this line between protecting free speech for very controversial speech that they're under a lot of pressure to restrict. Uh, but then on the other hand, if that speech is being um, criticized not only because of its message, but because it might be harassing or bullying or intimidating or, and here's the concept that many of us have been hearing more and more often in the news, um, <coughs> constituting hostile environment harassment in violation of Title VI of the 1964 Federal Rights Statute, then the universities, and this applies to private universities as well as public, any that receive federal funding are in danger of losing their federal funding if they do not take remedial action to try to prevent hostile environment harassment. And the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights has issued a number of guidances in the wake of all the uh, conflagrations on campus since October 7th last year in which they've said that uh, pr protected expression in protests may not be punished and may not be restricted, but can contribute to a hostile environment harass uh, mm -hmm. harassment, which means that the university has to take some action. And the Department of Education says the action should not be restricting the students who are engaging in protected expression, but they've got, the university has to do something. It has to offer support uh, to students who feel that they're targeted by the expression. So again, the university has to walk a very tight, you know, a tightrope. And last week there was an article in the New York Times that mm -hmm. I thought gave such an interesting example. It could apply to many universities, but it happened to be about UCLA which had been sued by the Department of Education for hostile environment harassment on violating Title VI with respect to anti-Semitism and not providing enough protection uh, to Jewish students and to Israeli students, pro-Zionist students. Um, the university settled that lawsuit and at the very same time it was being sued by a group of pro-Palestinian members of the faculty and student body who said, you've gone too far to suppress our speech. So, you know, accused of both not doing enough and of doing too much. And I say that um, with great sympathy to, to those who are trying to navigate these situations. Uh, one saving grace is that the <coughs> Title VI standard is a relatively forgiving one. Yes, the university has to do something, but it doesn't really have to do much more than make a good faith effort because the standard is deliberate indifference. As long as the university is not deliberately indifferent to claims of hostile environment harassment, um, it, it is, should satisfy that standard. So I think the law itself recognizes <laughs> 
This is a matter of judgment, a delicate balance, and we should defer to university leadership to be most familiar with the situation on their own campus and to take appropriate actions accordingly. I would just add that under Title IX also, it applies. Title IX, of course, you'll remember federal statute uh, trying to begin to regulate um, women's rights in athletics. That has been long ex extended much broader than that concept. And so now if you have speech or conduct that interferes with the educational access um, under Title IX, uh, that's anti-discrimination and you can be called, the universities can be called on that and their funds can be at risk as well. Mm -hmm. So the important point of Nadine's comment here is, to kind of connect some dots for all of us, is on the one hand, the First Amendment speech rights are almost absolute and, and well should be, with a few exceptions over here, defamation, obscenity, true threat we talked about in a minute. I'm going to ask some questions about uh, speech incident to and part of a crime. So that's the fourth exception. Maybe five reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. But on the one hand, you have this First Amendment, this robust, rigorous, important First Amendment speech rights for all the reasons that Nadine said. We don't want the government telling us what we can say, as, as long as it doesn't run into these four problems. Mm -hmm. But we also have federal and state anti-discrimination statutes, mm -hmm. your example, mm -hmm. Title VI, Title IX, mm -hmm. for example. And so th there's a real tension, a real dilemma here between the preeminence of free speech under the First Amendment and a federal statute um, or perhaps state statutes that say you can't engage in that kind of discriminatory speech or conduct. So you have a, a legal, a, a real conflict here. And the court has weighed into that a bit, um, but you and I know that the First Amendment is going to take priority over that. Yes, and I, you know, this may just sound like <clears throat> wordsmithing, but conceptually, I'd like to reword uh, what you said, and, 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 and it's a wording that I came up with myself as I was um, pouring through all of the cases in order to write my most recent book. I think that the word exception to free speech is not quite accurate because I think that all of the so-called exceptions are consistent with that bedrock principle that government may never restrict speech solely because of its content or viewpoint. And the so-called exceptions aren't exceptions to that because the time, place, and manner regulations must be content neutral. They must be viewpoint neutral. So that's not an exception to that bedrock requirement. Likewise, defamation, fighting words, true threats, all of the other so-called <laughs> exceptions are really not exceptions because in, the, in the, all of those situations, the speech is not being punished solely because of disagreement with its viewpoint or its content. Rather, it is being punished because in the facts and circumstances, it directly causes or imminently threatens harm. And the harm is not just to my psyche because I so strongly disagree uh, with the words. It's because I'm put in reasonable fear that I'm going to be attacked. That's a true threat. It's because my reputation is being directly harmed. That's defamation and so forth. And so with that understanding, I think the whole system makes a lot more sense. So let's take your example and bring it right down to a current discussion uh, in our election and in our courts right now. So um, one of those categories that you just mentioned is that uh, speech is not protected if it is part or incident to a crime. Mm -hmm. January 6th, mm -hmm. do you believe that President Trump's remarks on the ellipse on January 6th were fully protected by the First Amendment, or is it part and parcel of a conspiracy mm -hmm. to interfere with a constitutional requirement of receiving the electoral, electoral college ballots? And I don't know, and I'm gonna tell you why, because it is such a fact-specific determination, and I'm 
um, have enough uh, humility to acknowledge that I am not steeped in all of the facts, but I have read two different federal court decisions that have recited the facts in great detail and reached different conclusions, not only about whether this could be part of a conspiracy, but also another category of expression that uh, satisfies the emergency concept and therefore can be punished consistent with the content and viewpoint neutrality principle is one that I think all of you have heard about, intentional incitement of imminent violence that is likely to happen imminently. And arguments have been made that Donald Trump's speech on January 6th did constitute intentional incitement of imminent violence. And uh, the facts are very complicated. One judge um, mm -hmm. reviewed them all and reached the conclusion that the standard was not satisfied, mostly because um, at the end of his speech, Trump said something like, go in peace. Um, and, and somebody snickered at that, okay. Um, and, um, uh, but then another judge reviewing you know, similar uh, detailed facts reached the conclusion that the standard was satisfied. By the way, there was actually a fully litigated case. This is not the first time uh, Trump has been accused of intentional incitement of imminent violence. I think the first one isn't as well known. It was when he was first campaigning for president in 2016 at one of his rallies somewhere in the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest, I should remember. It's not all one big blur. I think it was somewhere like Tennessee, somewhere in the real heartland of the country. Um, he was, he, he, there were some counter demonstrators and Trump, as he often did, said to his supporters, get him out of here, get him out of here. And he made some very incendiary comments, such as, you know, in the old days, um, we got to rough them up, something like that. Um, and, but at the end of his, and, and some of the uh, counter demonstrators who were shoved out by Trump supporters were injured. And they brought a lawsuit, and of course, I hope this goes without saying, those who actually engaged in the physical assault are directly culpable themselves. The question is, should Trump himself be culpable for having incited them? And the appellate court judge in that case, it was the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, right under the US Supreme Court, uh, concluded, having reviewed all the facts that uh, even though Trump made some incendiary statements, he also said, don't hurt him. So I think that Trump is very well advised by a lawyer who knows the First Amendment standards, and he is going as close to the line as he can. Uh, and I don't have, you know, I think there is a plausible argument pro and con on both conspiracy and intentional incitement. Well, but may I say one <laughs> other thing, though? Um, whatever standard you think should be enforced in these cases, please bear in mind that it can also be enforced against speech with, by a very different speaker with a very different message. Yes. And I want to tell you about an ACLU case in the Supreme Court uh, just last year. We were representing D. Ray McKesson, a major leader of the Black Lives Matter movement, who essentially was facing exactly the same accusation of intentional incitement of imminent violence for giving a very rabble-rousing spe incendiary speech that had a lot of inflammatory, highly critical language against police officers. There had been, it was in Louisiana, there had recently been a seemingly unjustified uh, police killing of black male or males, I don't remember the details, and somebody in the crowd threw a brick and struck a police officer who was injured. Um, unfortunately, the, the brick throwing perpetrator was never found, but a very serious lawsuit was brought against not only DeRay McKesson himself, but the whole Black Lives Matter movement seeking to hold it responsible, which would have involved huge punitive damages and really incapacitated both McKesson 
and the movement. So the ACLU took this case to the Supreme Court and said that uh, that intentionally demanding standard of intentional incitement of imminent violence was not satisfied, notwithstanding his very the violent tenor of his rhetoric. And I was explaining this once to a reporter and he, he summarized it up very well. He said, so you're saying that what's good for Trump is good for McKesson and Black Lives Matter and vice versa. So let's always keep those <clears throat> counter examples in mind. Ex excellent. Uh, does it apply to my candidate or the other candidate? That, that's the true um, thoughtful test, I think. Um, before we uh, change to another topic, um, so as we hear more about January 6th um, and, uh, and the special federal prosecutor's indictment and amended indictment, the two things that they're going to be focusing on there as a defense as well as the prosecution attempting to avoid is, is this a true threat, mm -hmm. uh, an attempt to uh, incite violence, mm -hmm. or is this speech incident to or part of a crime. That's what uh, Prosecutor Smith's amended complaint and original complaint is about. And so you can see the defenses. No, it was mm -hmm. First Amendment defense all the way, or does it fall into these one or other categories? Uh, it turns out that uh, the United States, I think it's fair and I hope it's true, has the most robust protective free speech rights in the world. With one exception, there's one subject that is more censored in this country than in Western Europe, the United Kingdom, and much of the rest of the world. Does anybody want to guess what that subject is? Sex. Yes, it has to do with America's puritanical heritage. So we have much more robust protection for hateful speech, for speech that criticizes <coughs> government officials, for dissenting speech, for defamation of public officials. But when it comes to sex, we're very prudish. And my friends, uh, you know, lawyers, but other friends in, in other countries make a mockery of the extent to which uh, references to sexuality are constantly targeted for suppression in this country. And that happens, you know, all across the political spectrum for quite different reasons. Uh, depictions or descriptions of sexual or gender issues are constantly under attack. So we've had, um, from the right, we've seen many attacks on books and curricula in libraries and schools mm -hmm. and even colleges and universities that has anything to do with reproductive rights, with LGBTQ sexuality, books written by or about people uh, in that group. And from the left, um, in, I, I mean, I think uh, obviously sexual harassment that interferes with somebody's equal opportunities in the workplace or in education is illegal discrimination. But we have seen on the left what I consider to be, more importantly, the Supreme Court considers to be a dangerous expansion of the concept of sexual harassment. And that is any expression about sex or sexuality or gender that um, the person considers to be uh, uh, makes them uncomfortable or is inconsistent with uh, women's equality and so forth. Let's turn to another important topic for university life, um, academic freedom. Mm -hmm. Share with us your um, understanding of do we have academic freedom? Do you think it's a subcategory of the First Amendment speech? Mm -hmm. Do we have recognized academic freedom? And if so, how do you define it in this country? Academic freedom is um, not as carefully defined in First Amendment law as it is by the American Association of University Professors, AAUP, declaration that was issued in 1915 and uh, reaffirmed in a more elaborated version in 1940 and subscribed to by virtually every higher education institution in the country, both the faculty and the administration. And the Supreme Court and other courts have pretty much adopted the AAUP approach. And basically, um, the purpose of academic freedom 
is to protect the specific, unique mission of the university to pursue truth through research and scholarship and teaching and dissemination of the fruits of research and scholarship to the students and to the public. And therefore, to, uh, for faculty members to have the freedom to decide what topics they want to investigate, to investigate them fully, no matter how unpopular the subjects might be or the perspectives might be with politicians or with the general public. That is a great privilege. But with that privilege come certain appropriate limits. That since the purpose is seeking truth in accordance with the academic discipline, the faculty member must respect <clears throat> the norms of that academic discipline. So take, for example, the view, this core viewpoint neutrality principle, uh, content neutrality. That is inconsistent with academic freedom. Academic freedom means that we are constantly examining the content and the viewpoint of works by research works, you know, when we consider whom to up hire as a faculty member, when we consider whom to promote, whom to tenure, we are examining what they have written, what their research results and findings are. And if we disagree for a political reason, that's not a justified basis for denying hiring or promotion. But if we reject the merits of their work because it does not con comport with the appropriate research standards or investigative techniques in that discipline, or if it completely defies you know, accepted um, truths within that discipline, you, know, you, can't, you could have uh, somebody teaching mm -hmm. um, uh, astronomy saying it, it, you, could, you could refuse to hire uh, somebody who's seeking to teach astronomy who's preaching that um, the sun revolves around the earth. Um, that person would be free in their citizen capacity to go out on the public green and say that, but they cannot say that in the classroom or in their scholarly capacity. And I think there's a lot of confusion here, Tom, because a lot of people think, oh, academic freedom means that faculty members get to say whatever they want about any topic they want uh, in the classroom. Not true, by the way. You know, one of the norms of academic freedom that you're comporting with the mission of the university is if you are teaching a math class, it is inappropriate for you to say anything about foreign policy or domestic policy, regardless of what the viewpoint is. You are there to teach the subject that you were hired to teach. We agree on this. <laughs> My example is not astronomy, but organic chemistry, of which I know nothing about. <laughs> Can the organic chemistry professor come in and start talking about tomorrow's, next week's election? Mm -hmm. I love Trump. I hate Trump. Fill in the blanks. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> Compelled enough, speech. In today's Chronicle of Higher Education, there was an article that had, um, was reporting on a survey of faculty members around the country. And the numbers were low, but as the author, uh, I guess it was an opinion piece, the author said, anything above zero is too high. Um, <clears throat> how many faculty members <clears throat> feel comfortable telling their students for whom to vote for president in class? And 4%, so it's a low number, but you, I agree that anything above zero is completely inappropriate, no matter what the subject of the class is. And, and by the way, for many of our faculty over here, there's an easy exit for this. Go out in the hallway. <laughs> First Amendment rights, probably not academic freedom. Just go out in the hallway and have your debate. Not here in the compelled classroom where the faculty member has dominance and yeah. power and will give you a grade or not. And, and by the way, <laughs> the AAUP standards since 1915 have consistently said that it is inappropriate for faculty members to indoctrinate their students, that our responsibility is to stimulate critical inquiry, to teach them how to think, not tell them what to think. Yes. So you've mentioned twice now AAUP, uh, which is in the academy uh, 
holy grail to many people. Um, as you well know, recently the AUP put out a statement permitting uh, academic boycotts, and this is in the context of, uh, of the international discussions we've been having in the last year and a couple weeks. Does that violate academic freedom? Does that violate First Amendment principles of speech? In my view, it does. And you know, it's interesting because uh, it shows that even people who, maybe especially people who strongly agree on certain core principles can very strongly disagree about particular applications of that principle and, and people can change their minds. I mean, the um, person who had originally written the AAUP's statement, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name, a uh, female professor, um, had long um, written and supported the position that academic boycotts are inconsistent with academic freedom, and she recently changed her mind and spearheaded the organization's uh, change of mind. Uh, but to me, academic freedom means, as I said earlier, um, uh, enabling every faculty member, and by the way, graduate students too, anybody who's engaged in research, scholarship, teaching, to pursue truth wherever it may lead, and to that end, to engage as robustly and vigorously and thoroughly as possible with as many other people who are engaged in the same pursuit of truth in the same discipline. And in order to do that to the fullest, we have to engage with our academic colleagues all over the world. And I think uh, it's especially important to reach out to academic colleagues who may be in countries where they are being suppressed or where there are you know, various mm. controversies that, uh, that they may very well be <coughs> opposing the government policies at issue, and why should we isolate them and alienate them and make it harder for them to raise their voices to be critics of their own government? Uh, if I could, one last question before we open it up to our, our audience. Um, the other elephant in the room, perhaps, during this election year, in addition to hate speech, is uh, online social platforms mm -hmm. and the dissemination positive educational advantages or negative disinformation, conspiracy theories, and so forth. Um, our, our colleagues may not know that the United States Congress, a good number of years ago, gave the online social platforms legal immunity mm -hmm. um, from, from civil lawsuits, um, and hence probably more disinformation uh, as an incentive because they have immunity from lawsuits. Do you favor that immunity? Do you think it could be modified? Uh, do you think it should be withdrawn? No. Uh, the immunity is for liability for uh, communications that are posted by third parties, not by the platforms themselves. And when the internet was new, Section 230, as it's famously known, um, was jointly drafted in, by a uh, strong conservative Republican, Christopher Cox of California, and a strong liberal Democrat from uh, Oregon, uh, Ron Wyden. And there was already polarization in Congress, probably not as bad as, as it is now, but the two of them said this, they knew each other, I think they were Rhodes Scholars together, and they said, you know, we want to choose an issue that is new, and so the two parties have not yet developed their positions. This will be a great opportunity for bipartisan unification, and they agreed that if we are to realize the unprecedented potential of the internet to serve as a platform for everybody, right? Not the strict gatekeeping that we had with the four broadcast networks or the existing print media. You know, in the, in the middle of the 20th century, the journalist A.J. Liebling famously, satirically, but accurately said, freedom of the press belongs to he who owns the printing press. 
And ACLU and others, and Ron Wyden and, and, and Christopher Cox recognized that if these platforms were encouraged to allow anybody who had <coughs> access to uh, the internet to post on them, that literally everybody in the world could own a printing press. And many of us saw that as a great ideal in terms of free speech, in terms of equality, in terms of raising voices that had been marginalized because they did not have the money, the power, the education, the influence to gain access to these traditionally very highly curated and, and regulated um, platforms. And so in order to remove a disincentive from these companies to screen, you know, if they were subject to liability for what other people put up, they would have to engage in the narrow gatekeeping and keep voices off. So I thought that was uh, essential, and I believe that it continues to be essential. Since you mentioned the election, I, I, I brought one other prop here in my green colored folder, which I have to be sure, given the impending election, <laughs> now, don't get too excited or too distressed. Uh, <laughs> And you can read what it says. I'd read it aloud, please, for those who can't see it, Tom. Um, make J.S. Mills great again. Make J.S. Mill great again. So that refers to John Stuart Mill, the great 19th century free speech philosopher who wrote, I think, what continues to be the most compelling justification uh, for free speech, that uh, we have to put up with even disinformation even hate speech, uh, because even if we reject it upon re-examination, and he said every idea warrants examination and re-examination, even if we continue to be reaffirmed in our own view that it's false or evil or dangerous or hateful, uh, we will arrive at that conclusion with renewed vitality and be able to convey our own convictions with renewed persuasiveness and, and force. And that is the uh, metaphor that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes gave us in 1919 in the Abrams decision, the marketplace of ideas, the good and the bad, the positive and the negative, because somewhere out there truth will be found and at least it will begin to educate the people who will be better citizens, better going to vote, and that's what is so important for self-government, our constitutional public. I think it's time for our audience to have a chance to have at it. Yes, please. What could you, uh, or could you please speak to the fact that there are, there are public school teachers who are now required to teach the Bible? And also, um, for lack of a better word, maybe pretty up the uglier parts of American history mm -hmm. so they don't upset any students or you don't have parents coming to say that their student was crying because they learned about the Holocaust or um, Native American relocation. Yeah. I, I think both of these present the, the, the bad news, but it's also good news, is that I, I think both of those measures are squarely unconstitutional under the First Amendment. So the good news is that, uh, as you probably know, that there have been lawsuits challenging these policies, stopping them from going into effect. Uh, because of uh, not number one, that bedrock content and viewpoint neutrality principle. Number two, the compelled teaching of the Bible also runs into problems with another clause in the First Amendment, the non-establishment clause, which people usually think of as separation of church and state. One may teach about the Bible if one is teaching it as literature or in a comparative religion course, but one may not preach it as the truth any more than one may preach the Quran or any other uh, religious text. And uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, restricting what can be said about history, um, the fact that history, certain aspects of history might make students uncomfortable, you know, that's, there are aspects of our history and world history that should make people <laughs> 
uncomfortable. It's our responsibility as teachers, as parents, as educators to make our young people resilient. Um, they're going to have to confront actual, present, uncomfortable circumstances in real life, and we better equip them to do that uh, by preparing them in the classroom. Well, learning comes from common things. Yes. Yes. So those are, yeah. those yeah. are learning moments. Yeah. You know, I of guess my, my concern yeah. is that if you are a teacher mm -hmm. in one of these schools that's being you know, you and highly scrutinized. Yeah, public school teachers are highly scrutinized. Yeah, I know it's it's terrible, and I know it's it's easy for me to say, well, wait for the ACLU and fire to come along and have the law struck down. Yeah, that's I know it's so an easy. incredibly difficult time to be a teacher or a librarian. It's always been hard, uh, but I read about people retiring from the profession or. You know, sad, you know, <clears throat> sadly, even uh, make, having suicide attempts and anxiety, it's, we put such important responsibility and such uh, unreasonable demands on people who are clearly doing this as a labor of love, not for the money. And we depend so much uh, on what our teachers and librarians do, as is the Supreme Court said in a case a couple of years ago in which the ACLU successfully defended free speech rights of a school student um, against you know, charges that her speech was making people in school uncomfortable. The Supreme Court said you know, it is especially when speech makes people uncomfortable, especially when it's critical and dissenting and disturbing that it needs to be protected. And it went on to say, our schools are the nurseries of democracy. And we're asking teachers to bear that important responsibility and yet making their jobs so hard because they're getting attacked by parents, by administrators, by uh, legislatures. Um, in terms of education, uh, in, 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 in <clears throat> consisting of confronting students with un uncomfortable ideas, uh, upsetting their preconceptions, my favorite statement comes from Ruth Simmons, who was the, became the president of Brown University in 1991. She was the first female president of Brown and the first African-American president of any Ivy League university. And Brown was already experiencing what we now call, you know, wokeness of students saying don't teach, university students saying don't teach me anything that makes me uncomfortable. And in her very first convocation address, at the very beginning of her tenure, she said, education is the antithesis of comfort. If any of you are coming here to seek comfort, I say, go through yon iron gates. In other words, leave the university. And she said, but if you want to make a difference in your own lives and in the lives of your community, if you want to improve the situation uh, for the community and the world, then stay here and you know, revel in the discomfort. As the Supreme Court said in uh, Tinker versus Des Moines in 1969, Students don't leave their constitutional rights at the door of the classroom. But it was even better because it said neither students nor teachers yes. leave their constitutional yes. rights at yes, the schoolhouse other, gate. Yes, please. Yes, please. Michelle? Oh, oh yeah. back here. Right. Um, uh, something that'll help uh, uh, educators uh, uh, get over the over What's the hill over the is uh, the question is who can argue with the preamble of the United States that includes the First Amendment? Students should not be held hostage away. Uh, they should not be denied the philosophy of the scripture which is identified in the Constitution. So if you are, anybody's afraid of allowing students to have the the uh, knowledge of the preamble endowed by your creator. 
If you don't like American's creator, uh, they have others in foreign lands that are not so accurate. So, um, Sir, as, as I tried to say, but thank you for giving me an opportunity to try to make it clear, uh, schools are completely free and encouraged to teach about religion, they simp including the religious references in the Constitution. They simply may not indoctrinate in religion. So, you know, one easy phrase is you may educate, you may not indoctrinate. The Supreme Court has said uh, repeatedly, and, and, and perhaps even more importantly, the framers of the First Amendment, many of whom were deeply devout people, said that the purpose of the non-establishment clause is not only to make sure that our secular government is not taken over by, you know, it, it does not uh, promote a particular religion, but also to keep religion free from the intrusive power of government. And when the ACLU has gone to court to challenge laws that require um, indoctrinating in the Bible rather than teaching about it, our clients have often been devout Christians who think that it is completely inappropriate for secular government officials to be purporting to teach something that to them is holy and sacred and the um, preaching of it should be in religious institutions, not in government, secular institutions. Yes, another question, or, okay, yes. Uh, well, I, I asked part of this question of, of Mr. Sullivan last time, so <laughs> I'm really directing this to, to both of you, but uh, I'm putting it in a different context, namely the context of hostile environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that both of you are much too optimistic about the compatibility of the vast majority of uses of this concept of hostile environment with free speech. And there are countless examples that I could give, but I'm going to give the same examples I gave last time against pro-Palestinians and Palestinians. And we have three good examples, and I could give more, but I'm going to give the same ones I gave last time. Rashid Khalidi, this is a perfect example because he was subject to the speech code. He won, but it would have been a perfect Supreme Court case if he had taken it on. Norman Finkelstein, uh, uh, Salata, famous cases of the Palestinian or a pro-Palestinian were booted out in very nasty ways, never took the case to the Supreme Court. But if they could have, there would have been a, there would have been a real fight, and the Supreme Court would have used RAV, I believe, to crush the living daylights out of most uses of hostile environment, particularly when they're manifestly unfair and directed against Palestinians or other groups that are hated. So you make a, you know, I'm not an expert on the facts, and we know that the facts are really important, but you let me underscore a, a couple of points of principle. Uh, that the Supreme Court is unanimous on, and that is whatever the legal standard is, it must be enforced in a viewpoint neutral way. So if a university has a definition of hostile environment harassment or discriminatory harassment, it can't enforce it more strictly against professors or others with a particular viewpoint than it does against those with uh, another viewpoint, by the way, and let me tell you, the complaints of discriminatory enforcement are all across the map. A federal judge in Boston recently um, sustained a complaint against my alma mater, Harvard, uh, because of allegations, credible allegations according to the court that Harvard was more strictly enforcing so-called content-neutral time, place, and manner restrictions against pro-Israeli 
demonstrators than it was against pro-Palestinian demonstrators. The three examples that you mentioned, I think, were not hostile environment. I think they were just outright discrimination against a particular uh, professor expressly because of dislike of the viewpoint. And I think in at least two of the cases, the professor brought a successful lawsuit. It might not have been litigated to the end, but I think the, the Soleda case and the more recent case um, were, you know, I think there was unanimous or a very strong consensus on the part of the academic freedom community that their academic freedom rights had been violated. Norman Finkelstein, I'm sorry, I just don't know, know the facts of, of, of his case. It was so long ago. We had another question over here, please. Yes, uh, two, two of you both, thank you. Okay. Yep. Yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. um, to follow up on that, on his statement, because um, I, I did find it interesting about the post-October 7th, how speech has changed on campus and just period, right, across the country. And one of the ways they're getting around the free speech is re-identifying phrases as hate speech, correct? Not really, okay. because hate speech, the fact that it may be a hateful message <coughs> is not enough to justify punishing it. So I've often been asked, well, you know, from the river to the sea, is that anti-Semitic or, you know, is it advocating genocide? And I say, it's irrelevant because you are allowed to advocate genocide and you are allowed to engage in anti-Semitic speech. So, okay, so you're saying legally you don't think they can now say this is considered hate speech or this is it considered is considered hate speech but unless it satisfies the emergency so remember when those presidents were asked would that be punishable and they said it depends right. the message alone is not enough to justify punishing it but if the message is targeted at a particular person you know in a menacing way and you're following the person you're stalking the person then that can be seen as harassment or bullying you're welcome. If, if I could just put that in a little finer context. Um, one of our colleagues, uh, a former, just retired as president of Hamilton College in upstate New York, a colleague of mine at University of Minnesota, said recently to this point, if someone were out here on our green and used those words from the river to the sea, mm -hmm. that's fully protected speech. Now, many people might consider that hate speech. But remember, the Supreme Court says hate speech is fully protected speech. It's when you go over that line. But if that same person at 4 o'clock, to quote David Whitman, if that same person at 4 o'clock in the morning went in front of Hillel House, where we have students, both Jewish and non-Jewish students living, and started ranting and raving and screaming about the river to the sea, and I'm here tonight to get, that probably would cross the line and be intimidation and harassment. And that ha exactly <laughs> happened at Cornell quite soon after October 7th. People may remember uh, a student there went online and made very specific, <coughs> credible threats against um, Hillel House and students who were eating their meals there. And he was immediately indicted by both state and federal prosecutors. So the difference between a generalized statement where it's not in the true threat. It's not, I'm coming right now to get you imminent, directly threat, and it's going to be violent. And physical harm. Emotional harm does not count with the Supreme Court. The fact that you may have mental trauma or, or injury, that hate speech is still protected. It has to be violence to physical. So the difference between a generalized versus a direct, imminent, right now. I think we are at, or if not, oh, one more, please. Yes, we promised you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to offer an expression of gratitude and then ask a question. Um, I'm Trina Maggie, a library professor here. And uh, libraries truly see ourselves as a marketplace of ideas. So we're not just about distributing information, but also the protection of privacy, mm -hmm. a corollary right, mm -hmm. we think, mm -hmm. to um, free speech. So thank you to the ACLU for supporting libraries in this, especially as we were fighting the Patriot Act and you uh, supported the Connecticut Four who resisted an FBI order to look at library records. Thank you for that. My question is, in your book, you cited, I think, some very interesting examples of unintended consequences of hate speech laws in other countries. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to share one or two of those um, as, as a reason to be careful about thinking that the answer is 
outlawing speech. Oh, thank you so much for that and for, uh, for recalling those days when the librarians were our allies and you know, when you were not even allowed to contact a lawyer, right, if these, and you so bravely stood up for the rights of your patrons. And I agree that without privacy, there would be a deterrent to engaging in free speech, both receiving the speech and, and conveying it. So along with teachers and booksellers, um, uh, you are on the front lines of free speech. What I found so interesting about my research for the book about hate speech uh, was, to my surprise, human rights activists in countries all over the world that I cite in my book opposed punishing hate speech solely because of the hateful message, not because it was inconsistent with the concept of free speech in their country, not at all those laws were permissible under their country's laws, but rather because far from being effective in reducing mm. hatred and discrimination, the pattern was that those laws were counterproductive, that disproportionately the people who were punished were members of minority groups who were raising their voices to protest racial discrimination or gender inequality or religious discrimination. And you know, while I could give many hair-raising examples, I think I want to use the remaining seconds um, before I exhaust your patience to say that pattern is not a coincidence. It is the predictable outcome of the essential flaw of laws that go beyond the emergency principle and allow government to punish speech solely because the idea is unpopular or disliked. By definition, that vests <clears throat> an enormous amount of subjective discretion into the arms of the enforcing authorities. Hate is a very subjective concept. What one person considers to be hateful, somebody else considers to be exactly the opposite. I gave one example already, I think, uh, that Black Lives Matter advocacy. Many people consider that to be the opposite of hateful. It's advocating you know, love and equality and inclusion, but other people see it as and have attacked it, including government officials, as hate speech against police officers, hate speech against white people. Blue Lives Matter has been attacked as hate speech. The phrase all lives matter has been attacked as hate speech. And you know, in each situation, I can understand the rationale for people who are reaching that conclusion, but I would be loath to give to a government authority or a university authority for that matter, the power to d pick and choose which ideas are going to be suppressed. And I was speaking in person to one of my uh, international human rights friends um, who was quoted in the book, who was, uh, he is based in Hong Kong, he was born in Singapore, and he works on human rights causes mostly in uh, Southeast and Far East Asia. And he was uh, doing a visiting stint as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And he was astounded at how hostile his graduate students were to free speech because they were very progressive and, he, and they were human rights advocates. And he said, you know, the human rights advocates I know, including the feminists and the LGBTQ rights advocates and you know everybody in the human rights movement, they know that freedom of speech is the most essential right for them to advance their causes. And then he said, maybe in the United States, and this is bringing us full circle to the film where we started, he said, maybe it's that you Americans just take it for granted. You don't know how bad things were before you had robust free speech. And ultimately, even subconsciously, you know that you've always got it as a safety net for your own expression. With that, I hope you'll join me in uh, extending our appreciation to our very distinguished guests. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.